Accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints. Just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We're continuing our run through Star Trek Deep Space Nine right now. We're to be, uh, up to the episode called Bar Association. It is the 16th episode of the fourth season, aired on 19th of February, 1996. Teleplay goes to Iris Stephen Bear and Robert Hewitt Wolf. Story credit goes to Barbara Lee and Jennifer Lee, directed by LeVar Burton, our old friend, Jody LaForge. In this episode, Quark's employees, led by Rom, form a union against Quark's unfair labor practices and promptly go on strike. We're joined by Clay, as always. Clay, how are you? Good. Nothing says the start of a quality episode like a little Ferengi jerk-off humor. Mm Mm-hmm. He's he's been umoxing himself, he says. So he he admits to this uh, casual coworker that he's been masturbating quite frequently. Rom does in this episode. Mm-hmm. Quick mm-hmm. question, <laughs> yeah, unrelated to that. Um, is one of the other Ferengi in this episode just Nog with a different voice? Uh, the Frul guy is that who you're yeah, talking one about? Of the, one of the other guys who he's talking about the union stuff. Is that is that just the guy that plays Nog, but just? Using a different voice and a different no, it's costume. A, it's a different actor. Different it actor. Is? Yep. Hmm. There's Jeffrey Combs who plays Brunt. Yeah. Um, and then there is the guy who plays Frule, who is, I believe, is somebody different. And then uh, the two normal Frankie, but uh, Nog is not a part of this. I know the character's not, but the actor, it's not act- one I, of I don't those think guys. So. Isn't look, the same actor? I'll look him up right now. Frule, I think. How do you? Frule. No, he's there played no. by Emilio Borelli, which is not the guy who plays Nog. There is no Nog, only Fruel. Yes, which gotcha. is the Christmas uh, mm-hmm. disappointment at every CV or every grocery store that you ever go to. <laughs> um, all right, so let's uh, get started with this one. I guess we're going to take a break first of all. For uh, first and foremost, excuse me, I'm sort of drunk or something here. It's the middle of a work day and it's just been hectic. But we're going to take Stop a break. Stop rubbing your earlobes. We're going to take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. Me and Clay are going to come back, and we're going to break down Bar Association. If this is a surprise birthday party, you're a month late. It's not a party. We're the Guild of Restaurant and Casino Employees, and we're here to present our demands. The Guild of Restaurant and Casino Employees. What's that supposed to be? What does it sound like? It sounds like... like a union. Exactly. So you better take our demands seriously. Increased pay, shorter hours, paid sick leave. (laughs) This is no joke. Yes, it is. And the fact that you don't know that it is is what makes it so funny. And get back to work before I fire the lot of you. You can't fire us! Why not? Because as of right now, we're all on strike! Yeah! (laughs) All right, Clay, so I think it goes without saying we've discovered uh, our friend Dave, who we've done the Star Wars podcast with. He doesn't even know it, but this is his favorite <laughs> Star Trek episode of all time. Uh, actually, he does know it because I texted that to him while I was watching it. <laughs> <laughs> he's a big union man. Basically, I think Dave's spirit animal would be Chief O'Brien uh, in this one when he's waxing poetic about the the power of the uh, the union and everything like that and taking mm-hmm. a bullet for mm-hmm. the union and your, your brothers mm-hmm. and sisters. But um, yeah, it's a Star Trek episode about unionization. Uh, for all the pros and cons that come along with that. So what did you think about Bar Association? Uh, well, um, as I said to you when you told me the name of the episode, I was expecting it to be a, uh, judging by the name, it seemed like it was going to be a high adventure story uh, or uh, some sort of um, really bland uh, courtroom procedural. Uh, but, uh, no, it, it was, uh, it wasn't bad. I, it was better than I thought it was going to be. I, I tend to, you know, I, I, as I've mentioned, uh, probably many times the, the Ferengi episodes tend to leave me kind of cold, Yes, uh, which I think is a common for most people, it seems. Mm-hmm. I think so. Um, but you know, I don't know if it's just that we're at that point where 
the character stuff, even though it's kind of like low stakes, is still interesting. But I actually, I actually kind of enjoyed this. I don't, I, you know, I, it wasn't a top ten or anything, but I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, I thought it's um. I'm kind of at the point in the series now where I feel the Ferengi episodes, I approach them the same way as the Mirror Universe episodes. They're a little bit different, but I I don't look forward to them. They feel like every season feels like it has to have its Ferengi episode. It has to have its Mirror Universe episode. And then when they get to them, you're just like, okay, here's the stock adventure that we're going on. Um, I think the Ferengi episodes have a little bit more breathing room than the Mirror Universe episodes do. And I'll explain what I mean about that when we get to the next Mirror Universe Um, Mm -hmm. but the, the Ferengi stuff is okay. They're improving as the characters are improving with each other. And if nothing else, this one is, you know, this, because you're doing all the DS9 episodes, this would have been a tough one because I probably wouldn't have had, if you were not doing every single episode, the only reason I'd have to give this one to you is because it's very important about what happens to Rom at the end of this, where he quits the bar. Right. Um, and that's more, just more important than if you had just said, "Oh, by the way, Rom has quit." Right. It, w- it wouldn't have had the impact. <laughs> I don't think that you you need to appreciate about this episode. I think it's just um, it's an okay episode. It does okay by the Ferengi. It does okay by Quark and Rom. It's just I find it um, I find it boring, but not offensively boring. I guess, yeah. and it's like it's it's perfectly serviceable, and maybe that's just a testament to where the series is at this point, where they can give out. This is probably, if not the worst, it's the second worst episode of the season, I think. And even then, it's well, not so bad. That's not, that's pretty good for the season, then. If this yeah, is the, yeah. It, you know, I think what kind of kept me engaged was uh, all of the um, <clears throat> ins and outs of what the economic system would be like on Deep Space Nine and why this even needs to be a thing. I, I, I just was trying to run that through my mind. Like, why? When the Dabo girl's like, oh, I can't live off of blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, who are you paying? Are you paying rent to somebody? Who The Federation is in charge of the station, right? So who's like, and, they, and Cisco says, uh, you know, we own the lease on your bar. So I assume that meant that they own everything on the ship. Yeah. Uh, are, I assume the Federation is not taking money, right? Yep. So, so what bills does she have? Yeah. What bills does she have? I mean, the the only... It was my understanding that the only uh, real um, uh, worth the the only the only reason that money is worth anything on Deep Space Nine is be, is for people who are traveling through, mm-hmm. not people who are staying there. So I don't know necessarily why they are that worried about. I'm surprised they're getting paid at all, frankly. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you have no bills, uh, your modest income should be acceptable to survive on, I guess. It, it really doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense why they would be paid, uh, why anyone is paying Quark for any of the things that they can get for free mm. down the road at the little like replicator mat or whatever they I, call that thing. I would say, if I had to say who actually does need money, it's probably Quark. Of all the people who need money, it's probably Quark. Um because I'm assuming the stuff that he's getting in is going to cost him money because he's getting yeah, it from yeah. outside the Federation. So I could see why people would pay him, but I don't understand necessarily why they're that concerned about what they're getting paid. Unless they're, you know, let's put it this way. If the Dabo girl had said something along the lines of, um, uh, you know, I, I, I can't. If if without without that without that money, I'm never going to be able to raise enough that I need to get somewhere else or some shit like that. That would be make a little more sense to me because that means oh she's planning on leaving the station or she's planning for something after this, where money might need might be a necessity. But if it's just as far as like day to day activity on the station, I I don't really know if if you really need money. No, no. The only ones I would um. <clears throat> I would expand it past Quark. I'd say that the the Ferengi, as they mentioned in this episode, have like bank accounts back home on Ferenginar mm-hmm. uh, because they talk about seizing them. Brunt is talking about seizing them and wiping them out. So the Ferengi having money makes sense to me. And that's the whole part of their 
culture, obviously. Right, so right. It, it works in that way. But the yeah, being a Dabo girl, which in my mind is really just kind of a high class prostitute in a in a, <laughs> in a in a in a society that doesn't pay you anything, is a very uh, bizarre career choice, I guess. Because you could be in in the Federation world, you could be doing anything, and she chooses to spin the wheel of a Dabo table as a living, I guess. So. I guess maybe it doesn't really say much about the uh, the general population of the space station outside the Federation people. Well, you know, it, it, it this is uh, one of those episodes that just makes me extrapolate these questions. And I mean, not, these things don't matter, obviously, but um, like service services in general, uh, the fact that there is something like Quark's place, or even even stranger that there's a place like uh, Garrick's place. Um, Makes me think. Well, then, if that's the case, if these are services that required that that are making money and required to be are necessary to be there, does that mean that there's a limitation on who has access to replicators and stuff? Because you, you would th- think, yeah, yeah, you would think that Garrick is sort of irrelevant because you could just replicate a new shirt or whatever. Yep. Um, so. It's it's interest it's an interesting to to try and think about it like go down the line. I don't know if that's necessarily the intent of this episode, but that's why it kept me interested. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that the um, I think it ties into really why I can't take the Ferengi too seriously. Like the Deep uh, DS Nine tried its best to redeem them as a society, like how they work as a society, but they they're fundamentally broken from their original conception. Like the, the the original idea of them is just not anything that works. Even in the goofiness of Star Trek, it doesn't work. Um, A, because they're slammed into this post-scarcity universe where no one has any need for money. So they don't seem like they make a lot of sense. And it sort of clashes with the, the rest of the universe that we're experienced to. And then B, they're, it's such a cartoonish caricature of a character. It, it's mm-hmm. like there's no... The only way that you can do, you can't have a serious Ferengi episode, really. This one tries and it maybe accomplishes it okay, but you always need to have a character like Brunt come in, who is just a joke of a character who's like the the sneering uh, bureaucrat who comes in and is sort of taking a little bit off the top of everything that's going on. And they they play like a parody in Star Trek, except they're too specific to be a good commentary on anything like when you talk about Ferengi issues it's such a ham-fisted we're talking about modern day problems and these uh, Star Trek aliens are talking about it like unions it it doesn't feel like a union is a Star Trek issue that they should be dealing with it's funny though because I I think a union actually is a is a good Ferengi story because it does very much go against what their thing is Um, and I, I I did find it interesting that for a second, I was like, wait a minute. So they're not allowed to have a union, but they're also in control of something called the – they're controlled by the FCA, which sounds a lot like like a union sort of. Ferengi um, Commerce Authority is what it stands yeah, for. Yeah, I guess it's more of like a, a tax – Yep. Is it a it's tax the IRS. Or something like that? Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, yeah, I, so I, I found I, – I, I understand why they did it Like, because if, if you're – looking for Ferengi stories, uh, what if Nog starts a union that's not a bad one? That's not a bad one. It's it's pretty it's a pretty good idea. No, if you um, if, if someone came in and pitched that, I think I'd be impressed by it. I'd say that's probably one of the better Ferengi episodes you can actually do. And <laughs> the the downside is though, sorry. The downside is though, uh then the the person you're pitching to goes, all right, cool. So what are we what are we gonna do for the rest of the episode then? And then you hadn't thought about that. So you say um, maybe Worf fights O'Brien. F- thinks the ship is weird. <laughs> the I don't. Well, all right. So let's let's get the uh, the B plot out of the way. The Worf storyline out of the way. Yeah. Um. Before we return to the Ferengi, which I think are the the main point of the episode, but the it's another little B plot, but it it sort of matches the A plot here in that I don't know if it really matters except for the outcome. It's a, it's a plot that almost feels like it has to get a character from point A to point B. And this is the way that it happens. And they're more interested in just moving the character to a new spot. Mm -hmm. Um, So Worf moves on to the defiant. The only thing, the main thing I took away from this is that they're really focused on 
letting us know what's going on in Worf's world. Like the, mm. the, um, you know, I was, I was sort of praising it as we were going through the season. It's like, oh, they, they've got a good handle on Worf. This was the first episode where it's like, we don't need to know the same thing about Worf every single episode. It feels like you're just kind of treading the same, like he doesn't belong there. He doesn't feel comfortable. They did it in kind of an interesting way where they were like, um, he's, he, he finds the this, this station sort of shady. Like he feels uncomfortable on the station. And I right. thought that was kind of neat, but it's, again, it's another story of Worf being uncomfortable. And I was just thinking, we haven't really touched base with Kira recently. You know, like we, the, I feel like there's other characters. I know that Worf is fresh to the, the writing staff and they want to uh, write him all the time, but I feel like he's kind of imposing himself over other character stories that I would rather be seeing at this point. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I I wouldn't call out Kira. I would call out, I mean, shit, Dax or yeah. Bashir or O'Brien. I mean, when was the last time we saw O'Brien in any real capacity? But not not any time this season. I don't think he's coming Even up Cisco, with Cisco. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cisco hasn't done anything really since the Visitor, right? Yeah, I don't. Um, <clears throat> More or less, unless I'm forgetting. I mean, there might be another one I'm forgetting, but I feel like front. I haven't home, seen. Homefront's a big one. The uh, okay. when he goes, yeah, that one. Yeah. But even even so, it's like he has been very. It, uh, he seems like he's been very background this season so far. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that O'Brien and Bashir have kind of. Well, O'Brien and Bashir have kind of become a. Um, Bashir's been there, but when they're paired, O'Brien is uh, sort of the. The back, uh, the, maybe this isn't a good compare. What, who's the um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in Shakespeare? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. they're they're Hamlet. kind of that. They're like in the background. They're dealing with a story, but they're not really the forefront of anything. They're just kind of characters who come in and chime in on things. And spoilers, they both get killed off screen later. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, the bar. Yeah, I they've they definitely seem to be using them as as sort of like a, a light comic relief when they when they pair them up, which is nice. I mean, you know, it's it's they. Uh, <clears throat> they have a very I mean I think we've talked about this they 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 have a very good relationship as far as characters in the show go um so it's always fun to put them together but yeah they haven't really done much with them either well they did that one big one where they were on the uh Jim Hadar planet or whatever but um yeah, yeah. but yeah they're pretty they're pretty background I mean Dax Dax Mays will not even be on the show at this point I mean what was the last thing that she did yeah, aside she's... from show her cleavage to Worf yeah, she's sort of been put into Worf's orbit, which happens again here. Uh, they're continuing to sort of lay the track here about this relationship that the two of them are going to go through. Um, Speaking of the Worf stuff, though, what? So if he's if he's living on the Defiant now, mm-hmm. what does he do when they need to use the Defiant? He just uh, pushes his stuff under his bed and hops out <laughs> there. He and he's in command. I guess. He, I mean, it's really just he. The only change to me is that he's taken one of the crew quarters and called it his own, and no one else can have it. It's his. That's, that's the big change. It doesn't really feel like a big, dramatic change to me because the Defiant is just docked to the station. So it's sort of like it's just a room off of the station. I know. I guess I was just thinking of it like, you know, imagining having like a family van, and then you tell your dad, you know what, I'm I'm, I'm just, I need to get out of this house. I'm going to go live in the van. And he's like, all right. Sure. And then mm-hmm. the next time that they need to use the van, you got to like get all your shit out of the van. <laughs> it's like, what, dad, can you not take the van today? I need to, I need to sleep or something. But it's like, oh, well, you know, you chose to live in the van. Now you have to live in the house until the van comes back. Well, they never, I mean, they didn't really tie it into it, but I got the impression he was going back to how in the Sons of Moog, Kern was giving him shit about how comfortable his living quarters were. I thought yeah, he was, yeah. he was paring it down to become more of a Klingon, like he's going to sleep on this. Uh, rock hard caught. I said caught, Michael. Um, and <laughs> and uh, he's not going to bring any decorations. He doesn't want to plant. He doesn't want anything. He just wants Klingon opera on an iPad or an iPhone <laughs> or an iPod. And then he's going to sit there in a Spartan environment and be. He wants warped. to be able to put the cloaking device on so people can't see what he's doing in there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with his earlobes. <laughs> but I mean, it's a. It's kind of a funny story in that it doesn't really amount to anything, but it's just like, they're like, oh, give Worf another thing to do here and that'll be fine. And he's going to live on the defiance. And it's like, it's, I'm okay with it. It just, I don't feel like it needed its entire B plot to revolve around that. Yeah. And, and it seems like a decision or an endpoint that all of the things leading up to that decision, you don't actually see, or like they're not actually given any concrete marker. 
because it's just him going like, yeah, there's something weird about this place. And then he gets into a fight off screen. And then like a lot of stuff kind of happens in between scenes. And then he's like, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to go. And so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a strange way to, to, to get to that point. Like, I don't know why they don't just show the fight with O'Brien. Is it just funnier to cut to them in jail? I guess. I, I guess so. It's, it, um, and even so, they don't even talk about like what they were fighting over. It's it's implied that they're fighting over uh, Worf crossing the picket line or whatever. But it's yes. like they don't ever. But Worf isn't talk going into to work there. You know what I mean? So I don't. Right. I don't. It's crossing the picket line, but it's not really because Worf isn't working at the bar. So I don't know. There's also, no sort of scab argument. And also, Worf probably doesn't even know what the fuck is going on. Right. <laughs> like what? Why, how the hell would he know that the the Quark's workers are on strike, and why the hell would he care? Yeah. First, I, why, coming especially coming from uh, deep in the Federation, he should be like, "What the hell is a union, and why do I? Why are these people not working? <laughs> right? Why is it so empty in here? Yeah, it's uh, it's more like O'Brien was just kind of spoiling for a fight. I think more than anything yeah. was that was that he was he was looking to fight somebody, and Worf just got the uh, the wrong the wrong day to walk into that with, bar with a. <laughs> With all his talk about like the old unions and stuff like that, part of me was kind of hoping like at the I, I was thinking back, I was like at the beginning of the episode, it would have been great if they had done a scene where they were by this uh, this little pool of water or river inside the station that they had never talked about or shown. Mm-hmm. And then like towards the end, <laughs> there was like a hard cut to just Nog, not Nog, Rom floating face down in the water. <laughs> <laughs> but that's too dark. It is. Oh, that's what they were hinting at. That's the for, that's the foreshadowing. A thirty four phaser blast on him, or something, or was it thirty two? Well, if if that's going to happen, we know who's going to do that job. Yeah, yeah. The um the only the wharf scene not a we coincidence get, that Riker is on on board that day. The wharf scene we do get is um another Odo and Wharf scene, which is uh, tying into the whole. With there's too much Wharf. We, we're getting a lot of Odo and Wharf scenes, and I think they should spare them out a little bit more. Uh, it's another. But, it's another very much like we're gonna take the piss out of uh, TNG scene too. It is, yeah. Same with um, O'Brien has a scene where it's very meta. He's like, "Can you imagine how bored I was just standing in the transporter room all yes. day?" Is is a line that he has, which is funny. But yeah, I, wa- a, I I do wonder if that was the genesis of that that uh, that the comic. comic. Yeah, the yeah. comic. Yeah, it could have been. I mean, it's a. It, they they do seem to do that a lot. They do pick um, or make fun of TNG and it's sort of the tropes that it had there. And they, they do it there with the O'Brien line and then uh, the other thing that you were mentioning. Always up for picking fun at TNG. Mm. Um, I, I was kind of hoping in this episode that uh, um, Harry Dean Stanton and uh, uh, Yafet Koto from Alien were going to show up because it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, compliment to their... Uh, only being concerned about the the bonus situation in Alien, right? Yeah. <laughs> At least money makes sense in Alien. That's that's, what, that's why yeah. they're just dragging huge amounts of rock all over the place to get paid for it. Um, and then back. I mean, that's that's enough about the wharf thing. The the back to the Ferengi stuff is just, um, you know, it, it's fine. I don't I don't mind that storyline. It's good to get Rom going off on his own and doing his own thing. Uh, Quark and Rom have a couple good scenes with each other, but it, it felt a little just schizophrenic to me. Like yeah. it, it was trying to be funny at some points. It was trying to be poignant with Quark at other points. It was trying to have a Rom and Quark uh, head to head, tete a tete. It was trying to have a um, brunt comedy. It was trying to have sort of this union storyline. It just it felt like it was a lot of pieces that didn't really gel uh, by the end of it. I thought it was fine, but it could have it could have been a little bit more, and it just ended up being sort of flat. Well, I, I feel like that's kind of the problem or the difficulty with, with all Ferengi stories is because it's very difficult to take them seriously. Um, and that's n- at no fault of the, the, the characters. It's just that's the kind of the way that they're built. Um, so you end up having these really strange tone shifts uh, because you want to have a scene where Nog, uh, geez, Rom and Quark are – you know, being serious about stuff, but but Rom is always, he always talks like he like he's an idiot, yeah, and from yeah. a cartoon from the forties, uh, so it's really hard to take him seriously. Um, and you know, then they do you know some stupid visual gag or something like that. So it, it's it they're they're a strange they're strange characters to try and nail the tone of. 
Um, I do. I will say though that can we talk about for a second how great Jeffrey Combs is? Sure. Because that guy had. This is not the first appearance of Brunt. You might have missed his oh, first it's not? appearance. No, he's been, oh. he's the Ferengi Brunt has been in one episode before this one. Well, anyway, he's got like three lines, and he just kills it. Yep. Like that first scene where he comes in, he is just you know on eleven, but in a really good way. Like you can, I could tell watching him that he figured out how to project through that makeup because he's under a lot of makeup. Mm-hmm. But I feel like he's under more makeup than most of them are even because he. Uh, maybe that's not true, but I let's put it this way. When I look at Quark, I can tell that's Armin Shimmerman. I know what that guy looks like. I also know what Jeffrey Combs looks like, and I could not tell that was Jeffrey Combs. Yeah. So he yeah. has to project through a lot of makeup and those teeth. He's got a little bit of the Klingon thing going on where he's clearly figured out a way to talk around them. But I feel uh, but he, he does it really he embraced, well. He embraced the teeth difficulty. Yes. He, he, turned yep. a, he turned the teeth, t- uh, tough talking with teeth into like a speech impediment of Brunt's <laughs> almost. Like it's part of the character that he Welcome speaks Welcome back to Tough Talking with Teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Here on WXLR. <laughs> we got a lot of traffic out there. Let's go see what the weather is. Um, Isn't that right, yeah. Teeth? <laughs> is your name Keith or is it Teeth? Teeth, like in your head. Yeah, he's... he's um, He's very good. It's not his first appearance um, as Brent. It's not his first Star Trek appearance. He was in the horrible uh, Quark Wants to Take Naked Pictures of Kira episode. He was the guy <laughs> that was trying to have sex with Kira in that episode as an alien. Doesn't um, he also play? He plays a, what are the blue guys? He plays Andorian. A Andorian, play an Andorian and Enterprise. Yeah. Enterprise? Oh, yeah. Well, I guess I won't be seeing that then. Yeah, he's um, he's almost a main character in that show. They were considering him in the in the season that didn't happen because they got canceled. He was going to brought on, be brought on as a main character. He, um, I don't think he in general gets enough credit because that dude is a great actor. He is. Um, yeah. I think, I think maybe the thing that held him back a little bit was that he he does go from zero to ham pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just got to be the right thing. It's got to be the right thing. For exactly. Him. Yeah. I mean, when when he is cast in the right part, he's fantastic, and he uh, he always stands out. He is going to make another appearance this season as one of my favorite characters on DS Nine, which is coming up later. He uh, comes in as a Vorta uh, in one of the upcoming episodes. Ooh. Does he look um, more like himself? I assume he does because he just he has those weird ears on. Right? Yeah, they just have the ears and the uh, the purple eye contacts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so he's excellent. Uh, the rest of the Ferengi stuff, you know, it's 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 one of those issues. There are certain issues in Star Trek that you can't really. There are certain things that are very good to do as a Star Trek episode, like sort of, I'd call them semi obvious statements about the world, like equal rights are good, and like don't treat people badly is another mm-hmm. one. Once you start getting into the nuanced political discussion about the balance of power between management and union forces, it, it kind of <laughs> like it's not it's not a very satisfying Star Trek topic yeah, because yeah. it's too there's too much nuance. And I spend the entire time like I was fascinated that uh, Odo takes a very anti-union stance in this one. Like it, I was yeah. more interested in the stuff like that than I was yeah. Rom sort of fighting for the rights of his uh, getting paid more and stuff. It felt like a, it feels a little bit like a children's take on unions almost. Yeah. I, the Odo stuff I found really interesting too. Cause I mean, once he started going down that path in his, you know, speech there, I was like, Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. He just he wants would... to crack some skulls. He, he's waiting for the protesters and the, uh, the strikers to get out of line so he can go in there and start cracking skulls and re- uh, returning order to everything. Right. Which is, it, it makes sense, but it's also kind of weird that he would even care. Yeah, Um, yeah. because it doesn't seem like changelings have much use for money. Uh, So I don't know why. And, you know, coming from a a society of uh, whose entire people kind of exist in this one continuum of goop uh, together, you'd think he'd be all for the concept of unions. Well, Um, they do like order. And I think you could say that a contract is the epitome of order. Right, True. so maybe he, maybe he just loves the legal lease and contract language and negotiations. <laughs> it's something the changelings are all about. Nothing excites me more than a a tight work for hire contract. <laughs> <laughs> I I saw clause yeah uh, CFAR two point right here. We got to we got to redeem this one. The it, it's it's fine. You know, it's just like a 
there's nothing in, yes in in a horrible ferengi led society where the workers are exploited like this any sort of unionization is good for them but it, mm-hmm. it just feels a little bit silly and dumb uh when it's all said and done it's like all right good they've got a union cork has to pay people more i i also feel you don't really you don't really learn anything about quark here maybe you learn a little bit that he's like he's just trying to be a good ferengi um, he's kind of like Worf in that way. Like he's trying to be a good Ferengi, but he can be convinced by the by bathing in the waters of the Federation that he needs to adapt and do things mm-hmm. better. And they never even maybe they do it subtly, but at the end you almost get the impression where there's that almost like um boogie night scene where there's a tracking camera behind Quark as he's reopened his bar and he's mm-hmm. running into people and everyone's so happy to be working. And you think that Quark would have this moment of like, oh, maybe this was the right thing to do to like, I make more money if everyone else is happy underneath me. They don't really do that, but it's kind of subtly there. Yeah. Yeah. I, it seems like the big swing for, well, it's not even a swing, but the big character thing for him is, uh, is the, uh, I hate you, but I love you relationship with with him and and rom and i mean that's something they've done before i mean it's that's not really covering any new ground there um i was expecting at the end when rom quits and you know quark puts up the you know i don't want to say uh he tells him he's gonna fail but like you know he's 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 not super thrilled about it yeah um i was expecting that sort of thing where you know he tur- he's acting really cold and then he turns around and you know the camera's up on him and he kind of smirks or something you know something like right. that like they don't do that they don't do that at all he he kind of walks off pissed and um it's a funny relationship between the two because rom is very happy and he's sort of gloating to his brother like it's it's not a um it's not a reconciliation of them both seeing the way forward and being happy for each other they're kind of angry with each other at the episode yeah. in the credits roll which is a neat little a neat little touch it's it's different than what i would have expected it would have been great though if there was a scene where after uh he and Rom come to that agreement about how they're going to handle everything, he comes back to tell the union and then like one of them is like you got that in writing, right? Right. It's always got to like, be in oh, writing. No, when I trust my brother. <laughs> the reason that we're here, Rom, is because you don't trust your brother. Oh, right. It, it's it's actually yeah, Rom has re- led them into a uh, an even worse situation than before somehow, and the the FCA is is completely <laughs> taking taking a bite out of the asses of the Frangi workforce. We've, there, we've got the money that we want. Next, healthcare. <laughs> they should just, yeah, just move on to uh, any of these things. I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm looking at my notes here. There's not really too much else that I, that I think I wanted to talk about there. It's it's. Uh, I guess I'll close this one with just say, uh, have you ever been in a union, Clay? Um, if you're not in a union now. No, I don't. No, I haven't. No, I have not. I, I should know if I have, but I have not. Yeah, you um, notice because they take money from you every single day. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I have I have not been part of a union. Uh, my industry does not really have unions. Um mm-hmm. It's very Ferengi-like. Very, it's very Ferengi-like. It's very uh, independent contractor. There is a uh, there is a uh, there is a freelance artist guild, I believe. Um, I am clearly not part of it, uh, and I have not really looked into it. But I know a few people who are part of it, uh, but I don't really know anything about it. But it's not um, it's not very common, uh, and. I I wonder that is it is I have wondered about that is in businesses that are more based on uh, independent contractors and stuff how those things really shake out because that's I, there's uh, not to turn this into a wrestling podcast again but that's always been something that's been on floating around in the ether for years and years and years is is wrestlers unionizing because they yeah, yeah. are all independent contractors which basically means that they can get drag through the mud mm-hmm. uh, and they very often do um so yeah it's it's not uh short answer no i have not been part of a union <laughs> yeah it's um it's difficult have, to unionize jobs that a lot of people want it's easy to you, unionize you jobs that a, what's that have you i have i've been in a few i did the electrical workers when i worked for them after school uh i've done what the hell else was there? Amy's been involved in a couple of unions. Um, but yes, I've been in a few, two, I think. I can't remember what the other one is. I'm not in a union now. Um, but is there a union for nurses and stuff? Or is yep. that, 
There is. Yep. Okay. No, that's why they they always uh, they always go on strike all the time. The nurses. Um, oh, I didn't know that. And the teachers. Uh, so I've seen the the spectrum. My the union I was in when I was an electrical worker was probably the greatest union I've ever seen, both in terms of like the benefits and the relationship they had with management was very good. It was like you could understand why unionizing would be good in that situation where management and the union were almost equal with each other. Mm -hmm. And it protected you, but you also had to do your job. And then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, Amy was in the teacher's union, which is a joke at this point. Um, Uh. And so you get to see what the absolute worst aspects of a union can be. Um, and then she's in the nurses thing and we always have our dinner conversation because, uh, the nurses strike and I, we're not supporters of nurses striking. Um, mm. I don't think it's appropriate. The nurses strike. So you're married um, to a scab is what you're saying. Right. Basically. Well, yeah. She, she's never been a part of it. It's always weird hospitals and some of the hospitals really take advantage of their nurses, but I think there's just a better way to go about it. Um, I wouldn't want to be at a hospital where the nurses decided they wanted to go on strike. I think is yeah, the way that would be bad. You would think um, that you would think that nurses would be the, the ones that have the most leverage because it's not like it's not like you can just call and substitute nurses right yeah and you know the doctors don't really doctors don't take care of point of care stuff right they're the specialists so you you think you'd want the the nurses would have a little bit of power they do it's just one of there's a lot of nurses out there a lot of a lot of people want to be nurses so there's the um the crowd to choose from uh that's about it did you uh, have anything Oh, well, I was just going to say the one interesting union story I have, it's, it's inter- I find it fascinating how it becomes for some people very much their identity sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and our friend Dave and I uh, were, you know, this was after the big women's March and he, uh, and he had gone down to the Boston leg of it and was checking it out and everything. And we were talking about it. We walked into a convenience store and as we like walked in, he was saying, Oh yeah, you know, uh, a bunch of my union guys were down there and we were at the thing. And just the, just the word union sparked a guy who was at the back of the store, <laughs> like popped his head around. He's like, you guys talking about unions? Yeah. <laughs> like what? <laughs> And he's like got the hat on and he's got the sweatshirt, like the something something's worker five oh six or whatever. Yeah. And uh we and I think he thought we were talking shit about unions or something. And then we explained he was like, Oh, okay. And yeah. then he like was talking about union gossip for the next like ten minutes about some union we knew nothing about. Yeah. Um yeah. it was no, interesting. Some, pe- some people are some people are really, 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 really into it. It's it takes a that seems vaguely mobbish to me. That sort of reaction to it, like it's a. He reacted the way that like I react when I hear the words like Blade Runner. Right. <laughs> you guys talk about Blade Runner. Yeah. You talk about unions. You talk about my union. Um, Did you know that stuff was designed by Ron Cobb? I bet you don't know who Ron <laughs> Cobb is. Like, yeah, I, I think that's Ron my. That's the pro, that's the failing of the episode. I know they weren't trying to do it, but it's like. And, and maybe it's not even a Star Trek topic, but I, I feel you could have had a little bit of nuance here. Like maybe you can make the union disagreement between Rom and Quark maybe somewhat more interesting than just like I'm being totally exploited and I need to repair this. Like a little bit of back and forth would have been interesting. I don't know if it would have improved the episode, but it would have given you, me something to think about. Do you think that there was a pitch for this episode after the initial pitch when when they were like, oh, uh, Nog starts a union and uh, damn it, Rom starts a new union, and uh, we get to see, you know, how that affects the Ferengi culture and stuff. Do you think there was someone who was like, mm, "Excuse me, what if we send them back in time and have Rom start a union and interact with Jimmy Hoffa, <laughs> or like some shit like that?" There, that, I, that had to have come up, right? They should have met Jimmy Hoffa. They should have laid the groundwork in Little Green Men. Like they they're yes, running down the yeah. street and Jimmy Hoffa's like, hey, you bumped into me and I'm Jimmy Hoffa and that's that's all they say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're gonna take a break. We're gonna play an audio clip. Me and Claire are gonna come back. We're gonna read some patron thoughts, give our final thoughts, and then we're gonna call it a day. There's plenty to talk about. The FCA's involved now, and those Nausicans working for Brunt aren't just for show. I'm not gonna let Brunt intimidate me. <laughs> Don't you see, Rom? You should be intimidated. There's no telling what Brunt might do. And I don't want you to get hurt. You never cared what happened to me before. I always cared about you. I tried to protect you, save you from yourself. How? By telling me I was an idiot my whole life? I had to be tough on you. I was trying to make you a better Ferengi. What you were trying to do was make yourself feel important. Making me feel dumb made you feel smart. 
but I'm not dumb. And you're not half as smart as you think you are. Mom, you have to listen to me. The FCA doesn't have to answer to anyone. And if Brunt decides to get rid of you, I won't be able to stop him. Look at it this way. If Brunt gets rid of me, then all your problems are solved. You always said you wanted to be an only child. All right. Welcome back to the show where we slander union reps and uh, their horrible personalities. <laughs> no, but I'm not I'm not anti. I probably came off as sounding anti-union. I'm not super. I'm not anti-union. I like a balance between the two. And I've seen enough of the bad situations where bad management does one thing bad and then you could put a bad union in there and the same thing. A, a bad union becomes a bad management. So it's, it's just one of those mm. things. You have to balance it out. Um we're going to read some patron thoughts. If you support the show on patreon.com slash the Penske file, you get to leave thoughts about upcoming episodes. We read them. Holly McLaughlin says, this is a top 10 DS9 episode for me. Rom growing a spine, but ultimately for the good of everyone else. Alita and the other Dabo girls growing into agency over their own careers. The older Ferengi who are never going to become the exploiters, finding the courage to join the union organizing efforts. O'Brien knowing so much of his family history. Cisco taking a side without taking a side. Great dialogue, great side plot of Quark getting beat up as a negotiation tactic. Great ending scene with Rom, Quark, and the brother vibe. Uh, Zam Nuclear Vessel says... Bar Association. As with the Rules of Acquisition, a seemingly skippable Ferengi episode that has a lot of impact on the later series, including Dax and Worf continuing what may be the best flirtation between main characters in Trek history, although that's not really saying much. Stephen I, Cobb, Sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but I don't know if their flirtation is really that good yet. Okay. It, seem, it seems like it's... That's what um, he was saying, though. It's a low bar to get over. Yeah, because I was going to say, like they, they, they've only given you that one episode before where they were kind of get I, like, I think the last one was good, but this one, when she's like, Oh, Worf, you're in love. And he's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> with your know. ship. Yeah. It might be, uh, might be a little bit too early for that. I also found Worf's final line of maybe the world will bend to me to be out of cool, but out of place. <laughs> did, did that <laughs> it, it, it felt like an awesome thing to say, but I don't know if it's really, what we're saying about the character is kind of it was a weird choice um yeah i would if i was there i would have turned to dax and be like is he gonna kill everyone <laughs> right <laughs> as he as he like crushes a, a diamond in his hand or something stephen cobb says love having odo list security breaches on the enterprise he seemed to have the list handy fun little character developments with odo talking to both quirk about having to tolerate the protesters then with bashir and o'brien guessing who would enter the bar good use of cisco reprimanding Worf, bashir and o'brien in the holding cell uh, do, 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 do. I, I I did I did think that this was uh, funny because uh, the only Cisco we do get is another episode. I think it's is it two in a row? Yeah, because the last yep. one was the Sons the, of Oak. The, yeah, the last, two two in a row of him being like, "You guys need to get your shit together because I have real things to deal with here." Yeah, not yep. friggin' uh, ritual killings. And it, it, he it and very much fights. felt like he was talking, yeah, talking to children <laughs> in both yeah, situations. That's, he, he's 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 sort of becoming the father, the reprimanding father, which is an interesting uh, role. It's it's just weird when they have episodes that are very similar like that, uh, bump into each other one after the other. Kyle Barrett says, "I usually like Ferengi episodes, but I'm not a big fan of, and I'm not a big fan of B stories from previous seasons. But I think this episode probably could have worked better as a B story. I like Rom quitting, the broad strokes of the episode, and the brothers' relationship. But overall, I found it to be a bit boring and stretched out. But it was worth it for the shout out to Berlinghoff Rasmussen. It's still the coolest name in Star Trek." Chad Wiley says, a fine episode, though not a personal favorite. It's nice to see Rom coming into his own than rather being com just comic relief. The main draws are Jeffrey Combs, who is always awesome, and the legend of Sean O'Brien. Sean Alo Aloysius or something is his <laughs> middle name. Um, Matthew Ross, less comment, Bar Association. Norm Murray meets ear masturbation and the slow smoldering love affair between Worf and Dax. Odo telling Worf that his security was not all that with the cub muppets Worf needed. The Ra Union episode makes you wonder why the Federation and its administration didn't tell Quark to drink the root beer and treat the workers better. Even the Bajoran seem to have better treatment of its workers. It is their station, right? Hard to believe Quark's is the only bar on the station. Quark could make a killing with a bunch of holographic waiters, but the EMH is busy. O'Brien is the stand-in for Chekhov, except more tragic 
tragedy and less invention. The imperfection of the station and the realization that DS9 is cobbled together tech station makes the O'Brien cartoons hilarious with him staring into space doing nothing. This Mm -hmm. feels more like a season one or two episode, but the angry Cisco scenes were awesome. Go get him, Avery. Although Combs' appearance is welcome, he's a good character actor. His import is almost all Ferengi episodes is only comedic at best. Although the standalone and meaningless little interlude exists, you do get a sense of relationships between the main actors. The way the FCA is outmaneuvered makes you wonder if there wasn't an already clandestine union movement on Ferenginar. Seeing Rom don the gray of a the gray of a tech and drinking snail juice leads to only better things for him and better episodes than this. Clay, what are you going to give your... Uh, thank you, everyone, for leaving your feedback about that. Um, I know a bunch of them came in today, uh, which is much appreciated. It always makes it good to get a little bit of feedback about these episodes. But Clay, what did you think about this one? Do you think the fans are going to unionize against us? Probably. Hmm. But I will I will union bust like Odo uh, on a bad day. <laughs> I will go in there swinging my baton of justice and smashing some protester noses. Um, I would give, I would give it a three. Yeah, uh, this is you know I. I've this been is the perfect s- example of a three. I think. Yeah. I, well, I, here's here's my point. You were, you were, um, in the last episode, you're like, well, do I need to start recalibrating what a three right. is? I think this episode proves that threes still exist, and this has just been a very strong season. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say pretty much that where I I, I had been searching for what does a three look like now that the, they've raised the bar, and this is definitely a three. This is yep. this has helped me refocus a little bit to see what the. Uh, Although you did say this is the second worst, so is this maybe is this a two in the new world? I don't know. No, uh, I think it's a three. It's it, this is pretty much the definition of a three to me. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it, but I'm not I'm not excited by it. Um, and I think Starship Down was a worse episode than this, so I gave Starship Down a two. This has been the, this will be a three, but it's not a. Um, Remind the uh, viewers what that was. Uh, yep, Starship Down, you didn't actually see. It was the one where the Jim Hadar attack the Defiant and they go into the atmosphere and it's like a sub episode where they're sort of taking on gas instead of water and having to survive a disaster episode of a sub sinking. Um, that's too bad that that sucked. That sounds yeah, it it wasn't, it wasn't very good. It was unfortunate. Um, I'm going to give it a three as well. It is, this is like definitionally a three to me. Yeah. So if people want to know what I think of three, it's this. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's fine. It doesn't do anything great. It doesn't do anything terrible. It's just kind of there. Um, and that's about it. It's a three for me and a very strong season otherwise. But other than that, uh, I think that's pretty much it. You can check out the social media links, Facebook, Twitter, Discord, all that stuff. Go to patreon.com slash the Penske file if you like the show and you want to support us. So you can go there. Uh, you get a couple dollars a month and you get some extra stuff. You get podcasts. We're going to be talking about Night of the Living Dead for Halloween. That's coming out. Uh, we do patron streams, which I just tried to do one. Uh, went interestingly. We'll, we'll try to refine the process going forward. And I don't then, know what um, that means. Let's see. Anything else? No, I think that's pretty much it. Check that out. Rate the show on iTunes, all that stuff. Use your phone. It's easy. Blah, blah, blah. And that's about it. Clay, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, No. Uh, Poser 1 and 2 are in stores right now. Poser number 3 comes out on Halloween, so you can get that. That'll be pretty fun. Um, Yeah, if you haven't listened to the Badass podcast yet, I encourage you to do so, where me and Sean talk about Batman the Animated Series. And we are... I think we're going to record uh, Mask of the Phantasm next month sometime. So um, and we wanted to do kind of like a uh, cover the movie and also do like a listener questions and stuff like that. So if, mm-hmm. if, you, if you've if you been listening to the show and you have any questions or comments or anything like that, shoot it to us at uh, batasspodcast at gmail.com, B-A-T-T-A-S-S podcast at gmail.com. There you go. Send in your questions. And I think we're done. Uh, outside of that i don't think there's anything else we're done with this the next episode is going to be what is the next episode after this the next episode is a session that's right the bajorans come back session with s-e-s-s-i-o-n uh a-c-c-e-s-s-i-o-n a session session what the hell does that mean oh it's like to assess a session is isn't it? It's like the next in line, I think. Right? A session is the attainment of or acquisition of a position or rank of power. Yeah, it's typically a monarch or president. So oh, it's like as next in, in like line. A, like ascending. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, let me go here. And always, if you guys support the show on Patreon on the captain level, you get a shout out, which I don't always remember to do. 
but this time I'm going to. Stephen Cobb, Jay Stanley, David Kay, Nick Sergi, Nathan Elliott, Michael Pond, Matthew Cutler, Will Yates, Matt Flores, Samuel Custer, Santos Gonzalez, Robert Cummins, Andrew Cherlog, Spinobi, Russ Graham, Eric Johnson, Dr. Sebastiani, Neil Brennan, Bradley Killens, Mike Burnett, Matthew Ross, Ben Douglas, Gal Barrett, Joint Mango, Tark Latif. Having a lot of those names is a very good problem to have, and I gotta, uh, appreciate you, it very much. You got to make sure you do that, though, otherwise that's going to be a sticking point in the next CBA for the Penske File listeners <laughs> 503. <laughs> It's true. I'll just bring in some Nausicans and we will rupture lungs and break ribs and fracture eye sockets. <laughs> and that'll be all that they need to do. Okay, I think we're done. Clay, thanks very much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Guys, hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time with a session. See you later.